And that brings me to the last point, namely sometimes people think, ah, oh, but God will give us the afterlife. Well, that's going to be terribly boring because the afterlife is infinite, so you'll be hearing this sort of discussion infinitely numbers of times ahead. Think how terrible that would be. I can see already some of you are nodding off, but these are just managing to keep their eyelids just about open. I just get touch and go. <laughs> so I don't think the eternal life is out either. So running through all of those points, I would like to make a claim, a very clear claim, that God is a fraud. Well, God is fraud. He's fraud because if you do believe he exists, then he's having you on into making you believe that. Furthermore, even if you accept that he doesn't exist, then the characteristics given of God, whether he exists or not, are contradictory. And so buying into God is rather like buying into some of those subprime packages, but without the excitement. So my last words are, as I struggle to get out this tiny book out of my pocket, which I believe is the Bible, people sort of throw this around, like some of us in London. Um, I don't know what you think about the words in the Science Bible, but if you really think they were written by God, then you have been had up. These are fraudulent words. If, on the other hand, you think they've been written by man and woman, as surely they have been, and doubtless they've been written by pretty good people trying to do their best, but dare I say their best isn't good enough. And it's better at the end of the day to recognize that we have to live without God, because there isn't God, and we can be good without God. Thank you. I think I now understand how the great Spanish film director won well first. When he found himself in a situation not to sit to mine, he looked up and he said, thank God I'm an atheist. <laughs> Just before coming down here, I looked at the, the NASA website and I looked at the latest batch of pictures from the, the Hubble Space Telescope. And thanks to this marvelous piece of technology, for the very first time now, we have a photograph of a planet from outside of the solar system. Which I suppose reinforces the fact of reality that planet out on which we stand is a very, very, very small place indeed against the vast background, vast backdrop of the canvas that is the universe, the earth is a mere pinprick, which I suppose brings into sharp focus the age-old question, are we alone? And I think that comes to us usually in two forms. A, is Earth the only inhabited planet in the entire universe? And I suppose at the moment the, the evidence to the contrary is very scant indeed, unless you believe in the X-Files. And B, it comes to us in the form of this question, do we inhabit a godless universe? And if the answer to that is in the affirmative, and my loved friend is in no doubt about that, then I think that leaves us with a kind of a scary scenario, that we're all part of a gigantic cosmic accident. Last year I heard John Humphreys, the presenter of the Today program on BBC Radio 4, interviewing a very distinguished physicist. And they were talking about the Big Bang theory of creation, which I think is now widely accepted within the scientific community. And the scientist was telling Humphreys how now, thanks to science, we can go back theoretically to a point about a nanosecond after the Big Bang. And Humphreys said, that's fine. He said, that's very impressive. But he said, Professor, tell me. He said, what caused the Big Bang? Where did the spark come from? They set it all in motion. And after a short pause, the, the learned physicist said to Humphreys, he said, John, at this point, you don't need me, you need a theologian. Well, the theologian who was come closest to establishing the existence of God through the use of human reason was Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century, his famous five proofs. But one of his great fans, Father Hans Kuhn, in his book, called Is There a God, acknowledges that good and all as Aquinas' proofs are, they are not utterly convincing. And he says it in a very common sense fashion, if they were utterly convincing, we'd all be theists, and manifestly we are not. But that was as close, I think, as the human mind has come to establishing, on rational grounds, that there is a God. So given all this uncertainty, I think tonight's motion should be approached in the, the spirit of Indiana Jones. I think we should be prepared to be surprised and expect the unexpected. <coughs> But instead of being an invitation to go on quest of the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, which is, as you know, the title of the latest in the energy movie, this motion, in fact, is an invitation to go on quest of answers to some very scary questions. 
I love him as I suck it, I'm scared of dying. I think Woody Allen said it best. He said, I'm not really scared of dying. He said, I just, want, I just, just don't want to be wrong when that happens. But death is inextricably part of the human condition. And I will submit, and with great respect to our, our, our opponent, that both theism and atheism have emerged as part of our attempt to come to terms with the human condition, and both deserve the highest respect, because they seem to be, to be both authentic responses to the human condition. Patrick Masterson, who ended up as president of UCD, was for many years before that lecturer in philosophy there, and eventually became a professor of metaphysics. And when he was in that post, he produced a very interesting and provocative little book called Atheism and Alienation. And in that, he sought to remind us that the affirmation of God is one of the most noteworthy achievements of humankind. But he very quickly followed on by saying, that the repudiation of that information is equally a remarkable achievement of humankind. And I would submit that both of those responses are authentic and deserving of respect, and why should we disparage either? I think the argument that I have a particular difficulty with the motion because I think it, it, uh, I understand that John is to need to come up with something snappy and short and, and catchy. But it seems to me that the God that is proclaimed and worshipped by millions and millions, Christians, Jews and Muslims, is seen by them to be a supreme being, perfect in all his or her attributes, omniscient and omnipotent. That's how they see their God. On the other hand, the sponsors of the framers of the motion might have wanted us to be adept to the possibility that we are somehow being duped or fooled or deceived in believing in the possibility of God, deception being a part of fraud. But I would submit that the risk of deception is equally great on the side of the, of the atheists. Because if Thomas Aquinas could not establish convincingly, utterly, on rational grounds that God exists, then neither, I submit, has Richard Dawkins and his lead been able to establish on rational grounds that God does not exist. I take refuge in Pascal's wager. A 17th century French philosopher and mathematician said, taking everything into account, on balance, the best course is to wager that God exists and live accordingly. And if it turns out in the end that he doesn't, you won't have lost much. You will perhaps forsake him or modify a few pleasures. And if God does exist, then you will win everything. So, on that basis alone, I urge you to pin the motion.